world has seen some great and amazing travellers like Marco Polo, Christopher Columbus, James Cook, Ferdinand Magellan, Vasco da Gama and Ibn Battuta. These trailblazers journeyed to the ends of the earth. They were brave, determined and resilient. These courageous pioneers stepped out into the unknown and staged epic journeys across land and sea to explore and open up our world. By ship, camel or on foot, they travelled hundreds of thousands of kilometres. But surely our age has seen the greatest travellers of all time. They don't travel by camel, ship or on foot, but by airships, aeroplanes. And the greatest of these modern travellers are the pilots who fly these jet planes. They cover more kilometres and travel to more destinations in less time than anyone else in history. Today it's Paris and London, tomorrow New York and Washington, then Moscow, Shanghai, Tokyo, Sydney and Auckland. The world is their destination. Pilots really do enjoy a jet setter's lifestyle, one of glamour, style and entertainment as they journey to the ends of the earth. They are the ultimate globetrotters of the 21st century. Well, today, you're going to meet one of these real life jet pilots. He's one of those people who sit right at the pointy end of planes, who have our lives in their hands, and who we hear through the intercom, but rarely, if ever, actually see. This pilot has made one of the greatest journeys. His amazing story will surprise and inspire you, and may even change your life. So join us for the Jet Pilot's Journey. Have you got 18 hours and 45 minutes? That's the length of a new flight between Singapore and New York. It's a new record for the longest non-commercial flight in the world, a distance of 15,348 kilometres or 9,537 miles. 50 years ago, the so-called kangaroo run from Australia to London took four days and seven stops. Today, it's a direct flight and takes a mere fifth of the time. Ever since the Wright brothers' first flight in 1903, lasting just 59 seconds and covering a distance of 260 meters, the airline industry has been setting new records. Qantas Airline proudly holds one of the most enviable of these records, the world's safest airline due to its fatality-free record during the jet era. This is an incredible safety record for an airline that currently carries nearly 50 million passengers per year. Not only has Qantas had a flawless record for more than 65 years, but it's also the reigning world's safest airline for the fourth year running. Now, there are many factors that contribute to this immaculate safety record, but one of the main reasons is the trusty and well-trained pilots at the controls of these planes. These pilots are trained to the highest standards and can draw on almost 100 years of aviation experience. And yes, they're among the world's greatest travellers. Today, we're going to meet one of these pilots. Captain Graham Hood has flown 35,000 hours, has carried 5 million passengers and has flown over 20 million kilometres. Now, that's like flying to the moon and back 25 times. It's further than the distance travelled by all of the great early explorers combined. They say that airline pilots have the best office in the world. So, let's go and have a look and hear about Captain Hood's longest journey and the greatest challenge of his life. It'll surprise and inspire you. Captain Graham Hood. 
Thank you for inviting us into your office. Thanks for coming, Gary. Welcome aboard. Let's go in and have a chat. Wow. Graham, tell us about the plane we're in. We're in a Qantas Boeing 737-800. It's one of about 10,000 that have been built in the history of the Boeing 737. What's it like working in here? It's a familiar office for me. I've been in the aeroplane since 1986. And uh, it's a very familiar place, but it's a place that we need to be on top of all the time. It's fairly confined, but it needs to be confined so we can reach all the uh, instruments and dials and, and switches that we need to without getting out of our seats. Um, we spend a lot of time in here. We can spend up to 12 hours a day here and we might do three, four or five flights a day. But Graham, you've been on an even longer journey than your pilot's responsibilities. Tell us about your longest and most challenging journey. Carrie, the journey of life has been my longest and most challenging and I'm happy to talk to you about that, but let's go somewhere quiet. I'll change into something more appropriate and we can have a good chat about that. Well, this is more comfortable, isn't it? <laughs> um, Gary, you asked me about my longest and most challenging journey. My story began in a very dysfunctional marriage when I was, you know, in my early childhood, I was aware that my, my parents' marriage was dysfunctional. Um, they were two great people who lived through incredible odds in the, uh, they grew up as children of the early depression. My brother left home when I was uh, five, he was 17. He couldn't stand the dysfunction anymore. And I remember feeling really insecure in, in their marriage. Even at, as young as five, I could remember feeling that insecurity. And I grew up in the red light district of Sydney as a kid. I used to ride billy carts in laneways between brothels and, uh, and places of ill repute in the city, in the seediest part of Sydney. And then we moved out into the bush and we lived in a, in a 15 foot caravan, just the three of us, my mum and dad and I. And it was very, very uh, intense. You know, there was no way to escape from each other. And I lived through their dysfunction even more. And just as I was about to start high school at the age of 12, I contracted rheumatic fever. And I was confined to bed in this caravan on my own every day as they went to work for about six months. And in my boredom, I just went exploring the caravan and I found a box of girly magazines. And that started a a dreadful cycle in my life. I always wanted to be a hero, like all young boys do. They want to be policemen or firemen or soldiers or pilots. And, uh, and I found these magazines and it awakened something in me that I, I couldn't quell. It, it overtook me in a dark sense. And I remember feeling abject disgust with myself at watching this. I couldn't stop watching it. I became addicted very quickly. I went on with my flying career. I did it, I did it the hard way. I had to go and, and earn a living to pay for flying lessons. And uh, I left school when I was 13 uh, because of the dysfunction of my addiction. At that early age, I couldn't be at school. I was very much alone. And uh, I developed my career, that went along well. I, I thought if I got married, my addiction would go away because I'd be with a lady and, and all those desires would disappear, uh, which was a falsehood. So we got married for the wrong reasons and we were two good people who brought a couple of beautiful kids into the world. But we lived in this dysfunction for 30 plus years and eventually the marriage dissolved. My pornography addiction got worse in the dysfunction of the marriage. For me, the worst part of my addiction was one evening when my 12 year old daughter's reflection appeared in the screen that I was watching after I turned my computer off. And to her, I was a hero and um, I'll never forget the look. And I thought that would end it for me. I thought I would, um, I would stop then and there, that was it. And I promised myself I would. But with no foundation for that promise, I found myself two days later back into it again. And um, as you can see, that's a pretty emotional memory for me. But it eventually my, 30 odd year marriage ended um, and I met someone else. And um, this lady has, is somebody who's really helped me to understand my addiction. She's a psychologist as well. And together we formed an organisation called Mission Serenity and we devote our lives now to helping people deal with these issues. Graham, tell us about how pervasive and addictive porn is. 
Back in my day, when I first started uh, my involvement in pornography, it was very hard to get. You, you get it in subtle forms, like there was always a page three girl in a newspaper. Um, the girly magazines I talked about that my dad had, or I think my dad had them under the bed in a box. So back then it was difficult to get the kind of pornography that we get now, but now it's just open slather. But it's in everything that we, everything we, we use for communication. Our social media is filled with it. Advertising, television, reality TV programs are filled with subtle hints of sexuality and, and nudity. And there are a lot of children who watch pornography who are terrified that they'll never be able to perform as the porn stars on their, on their mobile devices. And there are young girls who think that the only way to, to get a boy is to behave like a porn star. It's destructive. I mean, children are seeing this stuff. That's how they're getting their sex education. Graham, what are the problems with porn? So pornography destroys intimacy. There are people who say that watching porn enhances their marriage. Watching porn brings other people into your bed, through your mind or through a screen. It destroys intimacy. It destroys marriage. It gives people a false sense of, uh, of how they need to perform in their marriage. So how widespread is porn and its problems? The World Wide Web was established initially as a military tool and its first commercial purpose was in the purveying of pornography. And a lot of the commercial systems that we use in online uh, banking and purchasing of goods, etc., and services came about by systems that were set in place so people could pay remotely for pornography that they could view on their computer. But I can remember pornography going back to uh, uh, French postcards in the First World War that were circulated amongst the trenches. And it's pretty clear that pornography was designed mainly for men and to attract men and draw them as an audience to it. Um, but, you know, females were attracted to pornography through novels, romantic novels, etc., where covers of uh, books were of scantily clad people in an embrace and then there was this romantic fantasy that they lived through. That was a subtle form of pornography as well. Is there any hope for porn addicts? Is there a way out? There is hope. I spent decades seeking a way out and couldn't find it. I tried uh, all the self-help groups, counselling, psychology, uh, seminars, all those things seemed to work for a little while, but they all faded out and I realised that I was trying to do this in my own power and I recognised that my own power was minuscule. I couldn't control this. I've never been able to. Who was I kidding? And one day my youngest daughter, the one whose reflection was in the, in the screen, uh, asked me a very pertinent question. We were talking about faith and she says to me, you know, Dad, I'm about to make some decisions about faith. And I said, oh, OK, that's interesting. I've never really thought about it. She said, well, that's what I want to ask you. Where do you stand on faith? And all through my life I thought, well, I'm either an agnostic or an atheist. And it was a very big question she asked me and I wanted some time to think about that. And I came back to her with, with an answer that was, I actually think there must be a God because I thought about it. And most of us don't really think about it to that depth. Then all of a sudden I had an identity for the higher power that could lead me out of this. I needed someone who had a greater, a greater power than the power of the addiction that was driving me, that I could package my addiction up in a parcel and give it to them. And Gary, for me, that was Jesus. I had a light bulb moment. So then I started to explore the option of Christian faith and I started to think about Jesus. I mean, I've seen the movies, you know, and, and I, 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 we celebrated Easter and Christmas and all of those things in ways that we tend to do, you know. It's a, it's a time to get together and have a party. But who was Jesus Christ? And in several months of thinking about that, I came to a conclusion. A man I'd never met ever, 2,000 years ago, died the worst possible death on the cross so a filthy porn addict like me could have a second chance. That's the power. That's the answer. And daily I have to commit to that power. I have to commit to what that can do for me in my life. And I talk to many Christian men who are addicted to pornography and that knowledge of Jesus doesn't come through to them. But I say, stick with it. Learn more. Understand who he is because he has the power to take this away. And for me, that was the most profound revelation. And that's where my hope is, Gary.
That's why I'm so emotional about it. Years of searching and it was there all the time and I didn't know it. That power is amazing. That power is there 24 seven. It never turns off. It never fades away. It's always there. Whenever I need it, it's there. I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to make a phone call. I don't have to make an appointment. It's there, always. That's the hope. And that's the hope that gets me through. So how can friends and family help a porn addict? Now, Gary, I met my my current wife, Michelle, uh, 12 years ago. And I was able to talk to her about all my issues in my life and she with me. And I was able to, to give up give up pornography, cold turkey at that time. It was also the same time that I, that I found faith in Jesus. So I was able to give it up cold turkey and I was going really well. And for about six years, there was no temptation or anything. And one day I found myself in a position where I stumbled and I had to confess it to Michelle. And I confessed it to her with great trepidation. There was a voice in this ear saying, ah, oh, what does it matter? It doesn't matter, you know, just keep it to yourself. She doesn't need to know. You know what'll happen if you tell her. It'll be the end of your marriage. And there was another voice in here, a quiet little voice that says, you know what you have to do. So I sat her down one day and I said, sweetheart, I have something to tell you that may destroy our relationship. And she said, what is it? I said, Three or four weeks ago in Adelaide, I stumbled on, on an overnight, I stumbled back and I watched porn for a couple of hours and I held my breath and I started to cry. And she looked at me with this warmth and she said to me, honey, are you okay? Not the response I was expecting. And I said, no, I couldn't feel any worse. And then she said to me, was it anything I did? And I said, sweetheart, and I want to say this to everybody who's watching this, especially the wives of, of men who are affected. This is a problem I've had since I was 12 years old, darling. This has got nothing to do with you in my life at the moment. So please don't take that on. And the next question was the clincher. She looked at me with a smile and she said, what can I do to help you? And at the moment she did that, I saw the face of Jesus because that's what he does. He doesn't condemn and isolate. And she doesn't condemn and isolate. And I've had a couple of stumbles and I've always been able to talk to it with her. And she takes on the attitude of, okay, what can we do now, sweetheart? What's the next step for us as a couple? Because we are one flesh. What I do affects her, what she does affects me. And she's made that clear. It doesn't condone me stumbling back into pornography, but it doesn't mean that I've got a line drawn through me then that I'm completely isolated and lost to my wife and my marriage and my family and my community. And that's the way we have to approach it. We will never stamp out pornography. I believe that to my core. But it's the way we deal with it. The last thing you want to do is take a good man and isolate him because of an addiction he's had when he, that he developed when he was only a child. That's just not fair, Gary. We have to adopt a different way and isolation doesn't work. If Jesus can forgive me, why can't you? And we have to work as a team together. Graeme, it's been a pleasure to have you on our program today and thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for flying with me, Gary. Cheers. It's a sensitive topic, isn't it? Pornography is the global elephant in the room. We all know it exists, but generally it's much easier to leave it as the great unspeakable an issue best left alone in the hope that it'll go away. But porn isn't going away. Rather, it's getting bigger. And the latest stats are truly disturbing. Every second, over 30,000 people view porn. The global porn industry rakes in over $5 billion annually. Porn sites comprise around 12% of the internet. Two-thirds of Australian men admit to viewing pornography. One-third of all porn users are women. And 60% of Australian children learn about sex from pornography. And here's why it's a real problem. In our hypersexualized culture, porn is increasingly seen as normal and even perhaps good. But in reality, it's far from being helpful. Porn provides a false intimacy and destroys the fabric of human relationships. Porn 
literally rewires our brains and changes us. The appeal and grip of porn becomes stronger and stronger. And as a person gets caught up in it, they crave increasingly explicit sexual images. A seriously addicted person can spend hours and hours at a time viewing image after image, often late into the night, ever searching for the one experience that will truly satisfy their longing. But that elusive satisfaction never comes. And so the process is repeated and the addiction becomes stronger and stronger. Porn is inherently destructive. It destroys marriages by driving a relational wedge between spouses as one begins to prefer porn to actual intimacy and the other feels that they cannot compete with a computer screen. And it destroys singles when they become trapped in the cycle of pornography, inhibiting them from healthy relationships with the opposite sex and forcing them to deal with the guilt and shame of leading a double life. Pornography objectifies the women and men who act in porn films and supports an industry rife with corruption, sexual abuse, drug abuse, sex trafficking and suicide. And most seriously, it destroys relationships with God through an infatuation, a worship of a twisted counterfeit of the good gift of sex instead of the gracious giver, God himself. It brings guilt and shame and separates us from God. But here's the good news. There is hope. God loves us and wants only the best for us. And so when we accept Jesus and commit our lives to Him, He sets us free. We don't need to live enslaved to porn anymore. We can experience true freedom. Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sins and mistakes on the cross, including pornography. Here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And that's the theme that runs right through the Bible. That's what Jesus is all about. Forgiveness, freedom. His love and forgiveness are unconditional. Notice what it says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus offers us a friendship, a relationship with Him that transforms our entire life, including our sex life. Jesus gives us a new identity and a new way to live. Please notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The old ways, the old life are gone and you live a new life with Jesus, a life of happiness and fulfillment. If you'd like to experience that freedom, that happiness, why not ask for it right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and goodness to us. Thank you for the promise to provide what is good and best for us. Thank you for helping us to deal with the hurts, habits and hang-ups of life. Lord, we want to experience happiness and life to the full. Please bless us now as we reach out to you and move forward in our lives as you intended us to do. Bless us and please give us hope and fulfilment. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Captain Graham Hood has traveled over 20 million kilometers as a jet airline pilot. But his longest journey and greatest challenge has been the journey of life. It's a journey we're all on. We all experience and struggle with life's hurts, habits and hang-ups. But we don't have to remain stuck in our ways. There is a healing journey that we can all embark on. There is hope 
there is a way forward. If you'd like to find inner peace and happiness, if you'd like to strengthen your relationships with people and with God, if you'd like to find a better way, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's a booklet called The Hidden Battle. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. Following Bible principles, strengthening relationships and social connections, keep you happy and healthy. This booklet will share secrets that will bring you fresh courage and hope. In fact, it could change your life forever. So please don't miss this wonderful opportunity to receive the free gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 333 in Australia or 020-422-2042 in New Zealand or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at P.O. Box 5101, Dora Creek, New South Wales, 2264 Australia, or P.O. Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey into the world of relationships, and the search for fulfillment and happiness. Be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together and experience another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can bring us. The incredible journey truly is television that inspires and changes lives. Until next week, Remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. <laughs>